Thank you, Rob, and thank you to NC Policy Watch for inviting me and for all of you taking time today to learn about yet another acronym. But I promise you, this is ain't your normal trade agreement. This is actually something that everyone needs to know about. And um, I'm actually going to start out with something that unfortunately most people in North Carolina do not need a lot of reviewing about. And that is the history, the outcomes of what has happened under our current model of so-called trade agreements. Um, since the almost 20 years, NAFTA will be 20 next year, January, since the almost 20 years of NAFTA, 19 years of the World Trade Organization, the outcomes have sadly proved the opposite of what these agreements were sold as. So the data, and this is not sort of a hyperbole, because I have a lot of data sets in here I'm going to go through. And by the way, this PowerPoint I want to make available through NC Policy Watch for everyone, because there's a lot more in this than I'm actually going to speak about, because one of the most important things I believe as citizens we ought to do is keep our mouths open. So these, in a way, can be sort of the talking points for anyone. If you, if you hear what I have to say, any of this resonates with you, and you want to know more, a lot of what's in here is stuff that you can use to tell other people about it, etc. Dig in more. So I'm not going to go, I, I have lots of text in these policy points, in these PowerPoints, and there's more in it than we have time to go through, but I put it in there so folks have something to walk away with. So, you know, the, the, the 20 years of these agreements, you know, without much hyperbole, the middle class has gotten clobbered. We've seen one in four U.S. manufacturing job outsourced, outshored, offshore, and that is five million jobs, but also a lot of high-end service sector jobs have been offshored, including here from the high-tech triangle area, things in computer, in the engineering field, a lot of stuff in actuary, statistics, there's a lot of medical diagnostics that's going offshore, and these are the high-end service sector jobs that folks say in North Carolina were told, well, textiles, apparel, that's like the old world, here's the future. Except under this particular set of rules, as we'll get a guided tour, there's a race to the bottom generally in wages. So the effect of trade agreements is actually not on the total number of jobs in an economy, but in the types of jobs. And what we've seen is we've been outsourcing higher wage <coughs> jobs. And while we have, I mean, this state's getting clobbered, third highest unemployment, but where some of the rest of the states in the country are getting unemployment levels down, in fact, the jobs coming back are lower wage. So we've seen a form of wage arbitrage, where basically we are in a race against workers in countries that get paid very little under terms I'm going to describe in these so-called trade agreements that guarantee that when investors go offshore, or for that matter, data is sent offshore, there's certain rights and privileges that actually incentivize this sort of wage arbitrage where there's no floor. There's nothing like national labor laws, it's national minimum wage. There's no global sort of basic set of rights, much less anything like a, say, adjusted living wage as a guarantee. So U.S. workers' wages are actually at the median level where the biggest part of the curve is in an in inflation-adjusted terms, so like what we can actually buy, we're stuck at 1970s levels. And this is not, like, this is not something that's totally new or different for most folks because, you know, folks know what it takes now to try and have the lifestyle that you had, say, at that period. Two people working a lot, more people in the household. When these good jobs, services, manufacturing, go offshore, you see tax bases shrink, and for folks who are in the education field, for folks who are in construction, or in the government sector, you see the effect in the offshoring of both the plants, 60,000 since the, the NAFTA and WTO were put into effect in manufacturing, but also the higher wage jobs. As we're going to see, in these so-called trade agreements, there are also rules that require us to import food and goods that don't meet our standards. There are some limits on financial regulation. The TPP could roll back a major chunk of the Dodd-Frank bill, which I'm going to ex describe how. So for everyone who busted their butts getting that passed or is worried about a financial crisis, if you don't care anything else about TPP, if you are for regulating Wall Street and making sure there's not another mortgage crisis, this is not your agreement. But there's already a little bit of that in the WTO. As well, 
We've seen in NAFTA and the other free trade agreements challenges in investor tribunals of domestic land use, environmental, health, tax expands laws where corporations can directly challenge, I'm going to describe how this works, and have extracted billions of dollars from taxpayers for compensation, for having their new investor rights set up in these trade agreements, undermined by, uh-oh, having to meet the same rules as domestic firms. Then we've seen drug prices go up. Now, a lot of folks know how the trade agreements have patent extensions. And everyone here who's, a, who's been a student of economics, you might say, um, a patent monopoly in a free trade agreement? Mm -hmm. bro, that doesn't make sense. But in fact, these trade agreements have patent extensions in them. They become really a way to deliver different policies that don't necessarily have anything to do with free trade. That's just the brand name. So in the developing countries, that can literally be life or death, not being the generics. In the US, it means things like our medicine prices soar, the budgets for Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, TRICARE get clobbered, and the big pharmaceutical companies' profits go up. The US has gotten clobbered in the agriculture sector. You know, agriculture is supposed to be the big winner we all hear from these trade agreements. This is one of our export sectors. We've lost almost 200,000 family farms. And perversely, actually, the volume of food exports out of the US is only 1% higher than for NAFTA and WTO. When you hear about these booms, it's because there were price surges. And the USDA measures by price, not by volume. So it's actually not that we are exporting more. It's that in certain years, there's been a spike in prices. And I've got a chart of this, which I will not linger on. But for anyone who's interested in those issues and talks to folks in the farm community, that's a very important point. And then, you know, it has not worked out so well for us. But how about in other countries? Because, you know, ostensibly, even if we were going down a little bit, given what total hell it is for a lot of working people around the world, if at least we had the comfort that people were coming up out of total abject poverty. And that, sadly, has not been the case. So as in the US, we've seen an increase in income inequality. So there have been elites in some of these developing countries who've done very well under the system. But in fact, we have literally, and we can even document this, seen millions of peasant farmers displaced off of, out of rural communities. So, for instance, NAFTA in Mexico, our Central America CAFTA trade agreement, it's just you can document in NAFTA when the corn tariff goes away and when mass displacement starts. In Mexico, food insecurity, the level above being actually hungry, and hunger have both gone up since NAFTA. So the GDP in Mexico has grown, but actually so is inequality, and there are more people in that country who are really at wit's end. You know, everyone knows this. After NAFTA, immigration to the U.S. increased 60%. Not in the first three years, in the fourth year when the corn tariffs got cut. Um, an interesting and perverse thing is if you look at all of the developing countries, the ones who follow these rules the most strictly, this package of policies, their growth declined. And the countries that have basically just ignored the rules, China, Vietnam, downsides for us when they do that. But their growth rates have actually sustained. I put in this income inequality slide because it's something that a lot of people are thinking about now, and I just wanted the data actually out there for everyone. This is the Department of Labor's data. When a US worker goes from a manufacturing job that is outsourced to, to trade, they typically go from about a $40,000 job, the average reemployment wage is 32,000. That's almost a quarter of their wage. And this affects wages economy-wide because all of these displaced manufacturing workers are then looking for jobs in other sectors. So again, Trade affects the overall quality of jobs, not the number in the economy. Now, trade theory has the gains from trade of actual trade of goods being on the import side. So let's just say, you know, you lose your job, and that's miserable. But everyone else doesn't, and we got cheaper stuff. So then, theoretically, under theory, you compensate you, because we're all doing better, because actually our income's going farther, because on the import side, we got cheaper stuff. That's the theory. You're not making the stuff that used to be more expensive that was made here before. Now, the key sort of data on this comes out of a theorem that Professor Samuelson um, is our sort of famous economics guru of modern free trade economics and Nobel Prize winner, that guy, Princeton. And in 2004, he actually re-ran his theorem, his math. And what he found was, as we're outsourcing higher wage, higher quality jobs, actually his theorem no longer works. Actually, the principal math underlying the notion that trade liberalization always increases, net welfare gains, is no longer true. 
And a lot of that offshoring is under specific rules in these agreements that actually incentivize offshoring, which I'm going to describe how that works. The net of the gain you get from cheaper stuff versus the loss at the medium <coughs> now is about $3,000 per gallon. <coughs> so even though we're getting cheaper stuff, what's happening to our wages outweighs that in the medium family. And North Carolina's got totally clobbered. I mean, <coughs> you guys have got clobbered. You know 370,000 manufacturing jobs in SNAP and WTO, almost half of the manufacturing <laughs> jobs shot in 20 years. I mean, what a wrenching disaster. 30% of your private sector jobs were manufacturing, down to 13%, and that's the net, by the way. That data is the net. That's the Department of Commerce data. It takes into account jobs created and jobs lost. There are over 200,000 specific North Carolina workers certified under just the one, very hard to qualify, Trade Adjustance Assistance Program. And um, that, that program you have to even know exists, and you have to get into it, etc. That is an alarming number. It's not the tip of the iceberg, because a lot of people don't even know to apply. And it's, you know, you've got very high unemployment here still, um, five years after, ostensibly, the crash. Some of the firms, and there are, there are over 2,000 of them in North Carolina, are certified. And by the way, at the bottom, you can see here regularly updated data on tradewatch.org at the, trade, at the dat, well, that trade data center. And um, that's a part of our website at Public Citizen. And what we do is we have a program that basically grabs, scrapes data out of all the different government sites and plugs it in so that when you pull up your state, you just get the data. But it actually has gotten flushed, inflation adjusted, and gotten scraped and put into one place. So you don't have to go through the Census Bureau for the trade balance and all that stuff. Plus, we have, under a standing Freedom of Information Act order, we got the raw data for all the trade adjustment assistance. So you can search online by congressional district, zip code, type of job, where it went, was it outsourced, was it imports that slammed it, etc. Just a few of the firms I listed there because some of it's counterintuitive. But everyone knows you guys got creamed in furniture, in textiles, etc. But actually, you guys have gotten totally clobbered in things like desktop computers and printed circuit boards and call centers, like high-end, the sort of the job of the future jobs. And it just, it's worth thinking about, because this is happening still. This is not like something that happened in North Carolina because of NAFTA and CAFTA. This is still a model that's not suiting, suiting well. I threw in the slide about the, the balance on, on agriculture because there's, there's some congressional districts in the state that are very agriculture reliant. And the bottom line of it is basically that our imports are rising faster than our exports. And if you look at actually volume versus the volatile prices, the whole thing that farmers have been sold, because you know, farmers were a constituency that really pushed NAFTA and WTO. This is it, you're going to export your way to, to wealth. In fact, 1% of is involved. And it's not just the old deals. So everyone will remember the big fights about, NAF, about the NAFTA expansions to Korea, Colombia, and Panama in 2011. <coughs> the Obama administration promised specific goodies for all these deals, which were actually signed under Bush. And um, it's now been one year that all of them have been implemented, year and a half for some of them. So the Korea trade deficit, the Korea FTA is our biggest free trade agreement after NAFTA as far as actual economic weight. It's been, this has been a catastrophe in one year. So here's what's bizarre. Everyone knew there'd be a big flood of imports. Why? Because the US International Trade Commission official government study warned us of that if you wanted to bother reading it. So everyone knew that would happen. We've also seen a 10% decrease in US exports, i.e. the opposite of the presidential doubling export strategy. <coughs> Now, part of that had to do with currency devaluation, which I'm going to get into when we talk about the specifics of TPP. <coughs> Trade deficit with Korea in one year jumps 37%. Like, that didn't even happen in the first year's NAFTA. That, that's phenomenal. And 40,000 US jobs, if you use the multiplier that the Department <coughs> of Commerce does, in one year of that agreement in manufacturing alone. Now, all of the North Carolina members of Congress opposed that agreement, but for David Price. And they did it for different reasons. Different things made them crazy about that agreement. A lot of the Republicans, it was about textiles. So the Korea agreement was seen as the biggest threat to the textile sector since CAFTA. And now the TPP would be like it, the final nails in the coffin, the dirt on top of the coffin, 
the grass and flowers on top of the dirt on top of the coffin that's nailed. That would be what Vietnam and TPP would do. But Korea, for folks in that industry, was a big deal. So your Republican members voted against it. So, so did you know, Mr. <coughs> Bush, Mr. Butterfield, <coughs> that was very good, Mr. McIntyre, but um, David Price voted for it. Now, I'm going to go see him on Friday, so any tips, uh, please let me know. I'm going to see him in DC. But uh, on the day of the vote, because I talked to him beforehand, he said, we have these cutting edge industries that have transformed our state into a global leader in science technology. They depend on access to international markets. This is going to boost our exports. And I said, from his mouth to God's ears. Unfortunately, one year later, in fact, the data is in. And the, uh, one of the sectors that he was pushing, the LED lights, the photovoltaic cells, easy for me to say, um, those high-tech sectors, exports are down. Exports are down 41%. So it's not like we're getting flooded with imports and that's the issue. The actual damn exports are down. And that's the, these have become some of North Carolina's biggest exports. You are not <coughs> a big export state. Relative to some states, you're not, a huge part of your economy is not in exports. So I just want to be honest, when you have a drop of 41% in exports, if you were certain other states, like say Washington State, you would have, you know, that would be a catastrophe. Relative part of your economy, it's damn not helpful. I mean, that's supposed to be a reason to be for it. You sure don't want to be for it, and it's definitely going to hurt jobs. But it's not, you know, I, I'm not trying to scare people unduly just because of the level of not absolute <coughs> dependence in the state. And then the other agreements, you know, Columbia Union assassinations have increased, more threats, and there's still the money laundering and tax evasion in, in Panama. Now, how the heck did we get into this mess? And I always, at this point, I have people thinking, but why is she talking about this stuff that has nothing to do with trade? Because we're supposed to, ladies and gentlemen, talk about trade agreements. And here's the reason I put in this slide. Because most folks think of the trade agreements as like the GATT, the General Agreement Tariffs and Trade. And that's actually what I studied when I was in whoa, law school. But it's no longer about those kind of agreements. In fact, those kind of agreements are what we had in the Bretton Woods era. So the Bretton Woods era, General Agreement Tariffs and Trade, and also we had these two other institutions that went from the World Bank, which we don't have time to talk about. But GATT was border taxes on trading goods. If you could not drop it on your foot, it was not part, actually, of the trade system. And we had a few rules. The little gap fits in my purse. In comes the corporate globalization area. The WTO replaces GAAP. And the WTO has 17 agreements, most of which have nothing to do with trade. In fact, some of them are so unrelated to a trade issue that they actually have to say trade related is what TR is, because otherwise someone might think that there was an accident in the printing of the document and the wrong chapter got put in. So trade related intellectual property, those would be the monopoly patents in the free trade agreement. Trade related investment measures has nothing to do with trade, it has to do with investor rights, it is not about moving any kind of goods. Or we've got the technical barriers to trade agreement. To translate that out of WTOEs, that would be all of our environmental, consumer, and health standards. I give up on that. They're concerned technical barriers to trade. I am not culpable for that one. And I may have hit it the first time, but that was an act of God. All right, so then we've got even a procurement agreement. This covers government procurement, what you can do with your state tax dollars. Again, what is any of this stuff doing in a trade agreement? The punchline of this is they're not free trade. They're not free trade. I have this vision of David Ricardo and Adam Smith rolling in their graves to see these things branded free trade. And they're really governance institutions, and every now and then you get someone to fess up and say that. Like the guy who was the first head of the World Trade Organization who talked about writing the Constitution for a single global economy. So we've got all these agreements. Taft and NAFTA, WTL, Chorus is the free, free trade agreement. They all have the same model. And now TPP, the Transatlantic <coughs> Partnership. <coughs> NAFTA on steroids, I've heard it called. They're really not about trade. And that's kind of the dirty little secret about why everyone in this state, every person in this country, regardless if you care about trade per se, regardless if you're employed in or you have a business in a sector that's affected by trade, this is all something we need to take really seriously and deal with because it's a form of enforceable governance. Just like we want to pay attention about what national or state law means for our food safety, or our access to affordable medicine, or whether the banks and securities firms are going to wreak havoc on the economy. It's the same dang set of issues. It's just in a different place. These are very different agreements like TPP. 
It's not about trade between nations as the main flavor. That is a dish on the buffet. But the, most of the buffet is all this other stuff that you wouldn't think is in a trade agreement. And the binding term that's in all of these agreements, I just quoted the one from the WTO, each member shall ensure the conformity of their domestic laws, regulations, and administrative procedures with the annexed agreements. Then you get 900 pages of non-tariff rules that are all these, this is how your financial system has to be, here's your food safety limits, here's how you can label products. And you have to conform your domestic laws, federal, state, local. And if you don't, these agreements are actually enforceable. So TPP would be enforced both by the ability of one government to challenge another government for not meeting the, all these 900 change your laws rules. And if you don't change your law, if a tribunal from TPP, which would be set up through the agreement, says you have to, you face trade sanctions until you change your damn law. If TPP goes into effect the way it is currently a chapter leaked, it will even be privately enforceable. Individual companies <coughs> elevate to the same level as a nation state to privately enforce a public treaty. They have called this <coughs> industrial state dispute resolution. That's a very sanitized version of privatized corporate rights to sue governments and international tribunals and demand compensation from all of us taxpayers. These are enforceable rules and they are not changeable but for by consensus of all parties. So you could be in Congress fighting over something, Congress passes something, it makes, your, makes you nuts that they did it. But you know something, you organize, you organize, you change who the Congress is, and in 20 years you go back and you change it. Not so with these agreements. In these agreements, it's in cement. So you have to get every country to agree to change it. And you have to, do, you have domestic laws to meet the rules you can't change unless you ever, so imagine, it's hard enough, right, to get Congress to do anything, 12 countries in TPP, because that's how many are involved. It's 12 countries, Australia, Brunei, Chile, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, US and Vietnam, plus Mexico and Canada have joined, and Japan just joined. But this is supposed to be a docking agreement, <coughs> which means any country that wants to sign up to the rules can just dock on. And the Trade Representative's office has talked about China as one of their top targets. So NAFTA with China, ladies and gentlemen, now that's just a great idea. And also Russia, Indonesia, all the Pacific Rim, countries. Um, the context and timeline of all this, just a little bit of backstory, and I can go into details, is this was actually launched in 2008 by Bush. It was launched at a time where actually global civil society had jammed up the WTO expansion. So folks remember those 1999 protests in Seattle against the WTO, that was to try and expand the WTO into all these areas of more handcuffing our policy space. You know, it wasn't really trade stuff. And there was a global fight back about that that just kept going. And basically that WTO expansion is dead now because of 12 years of relentless global campaigning. But Bush decided as a way to get around that, he would see what regional negotiations were going on. And there was one already underway between Singapore, Chile, a couple other countries. They had their own like CAFTA. It was called the P4, the Pacific Four. That's their CAFTA. And they decided that they would actually let the U.S. in on that. And Bush said, well, can't get anything done in WTO. Let's see what I can do over here. It was really a coalition of the willing effort that came out of that whole NAFTA period because here's another dirty secret about the TPP. This is like the monster from the movie that keeps coming alive after you thought you killed it. Because there originally was an agreement called the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Free Trade Agreement, the APEC-FTA, that was the previous zombie version of the TPP. And opposition in a lot of countries, not here I'm sad to say, but a lot of countries <laughs> in Asia and Canada did great, tank that APEC free trade agreement. The TPP is basically the leftover countries that liked it, like Singapore, like Chile, that are pretty neoliberal, and then the US. The big US companies now saw this suddenly in 2008 as a way to try and get a new model of rules that WTO expansion. Folks remember that free trade area of the Americas, the big NAFTA expansion that got tanked with the big protests in Miami in the mid 2000s? All right, that was another of the attempts to expand into this area where the public was saying, uh uh, no permanent rules on this kind of stuff. So this was just another way to revive this. The heartbreaking part is after originally saying he'd review the whole thing, President Obama basically picked it up as is, 
They have doubled down on it. They have made it worse. If you can imagine, there's since been 19 rounds of negotiations under the Obama administration. I might add the same negotiators who were there at the Bush administration, who were there at the Clinton administration, or there at the uh, Clinton administration, who were there at the Bush administration, are the same people who are now more or less doing this. Um, their deadline is to try and sign at the end of this year. Next year, I'm sorry, next week, there's a big summit in Bali that President Obama's going to be at, the APEC summit, and they're going to try and announce some meta deal <coughs> there. How has something this big gotten so little attention? I mean, just on the notion of 12 countries, the biggest trade negotiations with WTO, you'd figure you would have heard about it. But this has been the most secretive process I have ever seen in trade negotiations, and I have followed all of them since 1990. So um, up until last month, Members of Congress were not being allowed to see the draft text of this agreement, which is almost done. It's like the text 90% done. The 10% are the knockdown drag on issues that they could fight about for the next 15 years. But the text <coughs> itself is 90% done. There's like a phone book text called the TPP. And negotiators from other countries can see it. Some business guys can see it. Congress is not being allowed to see it. And you all and the press still can't see it, except for the parts that have <coughs> leaked. And you can see that in our website, tradewatch.org, with a guided tour of what each provision means. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of what we know in the TPP is either from those leaks or because some of us are bird dogging the negotiations. We go fawn around the negotiations. And actually, negotiators from other countries are more likely to raise concerns with things that the US negotiators are raising. Because again, heartbreakingly, a lot of what the US negotiating agenda is is not representing a lot of us or our NAFTA experience, but is largely representing what a lot of big U.S. companies are looking for. So the pharma goals, the chronic offshoring U.S. companies who want to make sure there are no severe conditions and rights for their being able to buy up plants and land, the oil and gas companies who want rights to go rip up and you know, own basically chunks of area where they think they might find new oil and gas reserves. A lot of members of Congress are trying to get really mad about the secrecy. And it's, it's transparency. So you got Daryl Issa, not a guy who would generally be the first guy to think of as really voicing concerns about a large corporate agenda, who um, is really unhinged about this because even though he's the chairman of the Oversight Committee, one of the negotiations was in his congressional district, he was denied observer status. Which, you know, even during NAFTA, which was no paradigm of openness, let me tell you, any member of Congress had observer status. They have exclusive constitutional authority over trade, which is, you know, slightly relevant to that question. Um, it's not just ISA, by the way, it's been Democrats too. And it got to a point where the guy who's the chairman of the trade subcommittee in the Senate, the guy who's jurisdiction over this, who's a very staunch free trader, a guy who loved all the agreements, CAFTA included, um, basically went to the floor and was sort of channeling Ralph Nader in outrage about how even he was not being allowed to see the agreement. Um, Senator Warren, you know, opposed the trade representative <coughs> nomination over the secrecy, etc. Oh, and this quote in the bottom is great, because that guy, <coughs> Warren, the guy who helped negotiate NAFTA, and he basically thinks it's the most secretive agreement you've ever seen. Now, what do we know is in there from the leaks from the snooping? The incentives to offshore American jobs. The investment chapter has this tax that was in NAFTA, but way blown out worse. They give special rights and protections if you leave. It basically takes away almost all the risks of relocating. So number one, you get guaranteed compensation, you get what's called a minimum standard of treatment if you leave. You get compensation for regulatory costs and certainty for not a change in regulatory environment. Hello, what happens when you discover something new and different and you need to like take care of that? So you have this deal and you're cemented into like now, and then you just realize that something has to be regulated or well, hmm, we did that with energy deregulation, financial deregulation, real problem. Plus, plus, it basically guarantees you never have to rely on the other country's courts. So if you ever have a contract problem, et cetera, the company basically has the right, the governments bind themselves to these extrajudicial tribunals at the World Bank and the UN, and its business lawyers sit as judges. It's like a conflict of interest thing that would like that is just unbelievable. They rotate between suing governments for corporations and being the judges. And these guys get to basically be the place where these contract disputes get worked out. And so you never have to rely on a domestic court. So all the risks of why you leave, gone. And Vietnam is in this agreement. Vietnam is the low wage offshoring alternative to China. Vietnam is like where the Chinese companies go when they need to find a cheap place to go. And some of the other countries I have listed here could, could be in the deal. 
There's also, by the way, for folks who are in the high tech sector, a big push to get TPP visas to bring uh, workers from the TPP countries into the US in the different high tech fields. And um, you know, the, the hitch with this is the, is the perennial one. It's like an endangered circuit to a problem because you basically have a company in charge of your visa. So if you try and organize a union and the company decides you're a pain in the butt, you end up suddenly finding that you are no longer needed and the company doesn't sign <coughs> your visa anymore. The, the free trade agreements the US has with Chile and Singapore have visas. And now the other countries are saying, wow, they're in this agreement with us. Why do they get visas and we don't get visas? We want visas. Um, in trade terms, just because everyone thinks I've totally lost it and how can there be immigration policy in a trade agreement. Um, it technically is called, it's in the services chapter, it's called mode four of services delivery movement of natural persons across borders. <laughs> it's actually a chart of trade and market access in bodies. Um, there's a rule in the procurement <coughs> chapter that bans preferences for local. So that would basically blow out Buy America or Buy North Carolina. The rule is you have to give what's called national treatment, equal treatment to any firm, it's like the Chinese state-owned enterprises in Vietnam, any firm in any of the TPP countries has to have the same um, level of preference given to US companies under our Buy America and Buy America, <coughs> two different programs, which are you know government programs that basically recycle tax dollars into American firms. When the government's buying the stuff, it puts the money back into our jobs. It's um, just as an economics matter with TPP, it's lunatic because if you take all the other TPP countries together, including Japan, their procurement market, ours is three times bigger just at the national level. Theirs, like top to bottom, local state, be put together. I mean, just given the nature of the size of the economies. Um, and it's also problematic that these rules, and actually members of Congress have double-checked this, so we've seen the final chapter on this, and they cannot tell us the details, but they can nod when we say, is it true that the language that would basically undermine sweat-free, recycled content, et cetera, is that bad language in there? So it is not just you can't have preferences, but also the kind of conditions you set. So think of all the cool procurement kind of tools you would set. So you want to have sweat-free procurement for uniforms for the city, for the police, for it. Or you want to actually have requirements of local <coughs> food for the school lunch program. All those kind of conditionalities are subject to challenge. Now, back to this business of the corporate tribunals. So I have a bunch of slides in here. These are mainly because most people who haven't heard about this so-called investor state thing think it is unbelievable. So I have put down all the background so they can sort of sit in that and think about that because it is actually mind-boggling as an objective matter. So the way it works is the U.S. in the TPP, because this chapter is leaked, so we actually have this on our website, tradewatch.org, you can go look at it. The U.S. and all the other countries <coughs> submit themselves to the jurisdiction of these international arbitration tribunals, and any foreign corporation in one of the TPP countries could directly challenge any domestic law or government action before one of these tribunals. So not our laws, not our courts, even though the foreign investor is in our country, they skirt our laws and courts, go to the International Tribunal, use the TPP obligations, rules, and privileges, and demand compensation from us, the Federal Treasury, our taxpayers' money, for undermining expected future profits is one of the standards, for changes in regulatory expectations is the, is the term of art. And this is something that the companies initiate whenever they want, and they pick two of the judges and the judges are a list <coughs> of lawyers who are arbitrators, and they rotate between being the judge and the person suing the government. Thus, the kangaroo court. Except I cannot use that slide in Australia because they say, this is so rotten, it is an insult to every marsupial. You can even call this a kangaroo court. It is beyond kangaroo court. The, the notion of that rotation is a natural conflict of interest. Because you know, what does that mean? One day, you two and you are the judge, and you're the lawyer who's actually arguing for a corporation that you three should give government money to the corporation. But the next day, you three are the judges, and your buddy now, who would otherwise be the judge, is the lawyer. Well, how the heck is that going to work out, right? That is not good. Besides the fact that foreign companies are given special privileges so that they actually get better treatment in the country. Now, you know, some members of Congress sadly like this. They say, well, let's not think so defensively. Let's think about what it means when our companies are fair. Think of the great things they can do when I just you know, start thinking of the cases 
and like what Chevron has done using these rights, and what Mobile has done using these rights. And I'm not thinking that's a good idea for our companies either. Interestingly, Australia refuses to be submitted to this regime in TPP. And they have stuck to that position even though they have just elected a super conservative government. So their, their labor government lost its election you know, 10 days ago. The new government's now been put into effect. It's a super, super, super conservative government. And they've just reiterated, this is not in the national interest. This is not in the national interest. So it begs the question of why the heck the US is not only willing to do it, but I, here's a heartbreak warning. We are pushing it. And in fact, we're pummeling Australia to tell them they can't be left out. There's over $350 million of money paid out to corporations just under NAFTA, which is a much narrower version of this thing than what they're pushing for TPP. And it's land use, timber, water rights, tax expands. Under one of the US bilateral investment treaties, this is Ecuador and Chevron, $2.3 billion in one case. Now all this other stuff, I'm just gonna zip through. Again, slides available to everyone. And I can even put them up on our website if you guys don't want to put them up. But basically, this gives you the details. And also, this document on our website is a list of every one of those NAFTA cases, where it was litigated, how much money, a summary of what was involved, and links back. Now, most of it's secret, because these are private arbitrations. And the stuff at the World Bank, they don't even tell you it's happening. At least, I'm sorry, the stuff at the UN, they don't tell you it's happening. At least at ICSID, at the World Bank, and these are the actual legal names of the, of the arbitration venues, et cetera. The tribunals, you can't have an outside appeal. There's no outside appeal. There's no place to go, and they're not bound by precedent. So they just cook up these lunatic rulings. And you know, I put on the top some of these really, you know, Philip Morris, so Eli Lilly is right now challenging Canada's entire medicine patent system under NAFTA using this. I mean, they're, 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 it would not be believable, but for actually it's happening. Um, and it's been an epidemic of these cases. So some of, there were some trees that had this stuff in the <coughs> investor state. But really, since NAFTA, there's been an explosion in the use of it. And we did a study of how many corporations, there'd be almost 10,000 more corporations that are cross-registered between the U.S. and someplace else in the TPP zone who would be able to attack U.S. laws. There are 450 of these cases underway now. There are 15 of these rotating arbitrator lawyer guys who are now involved in 55% of the cases. There's a whole special industry of, of third-party financing, tribunalists, etc. It's like a system to raid the treasury. And these are just some of the cases. Attack on Egypt's post-revolution minimum wage, attacks on black Africa's empowerment, black empowerment, South Africa's black empowerment policy, which is the sort of like get the economy back in the hands of the majority of the people in the country law, the Eli Lilly case, El Salvador on mining and um, water policies, Canada's paid repeatedly over toxic bans that we don't have, but we should. Um, there's a Canadian firm that basically won on the merits challenging a U.S. state Supreme Court's rules of civil procedure uh, and the very notion of a jury trial. Thank God their bankruptcy attorney filed them in bankruptcy as a U.S. corporation to dodge their liability in Canada so we never had to pay because they were no longer a Canadian company. They were now a U.S. company and you have to be a foreign investor. You get the point. Um, right now we've got basically Philip Morris going after two different countries, cigarette, tobacco rules, et cetera. So investor state, maybe the worst thing in that whole agreement, but the financial deregulation stuff's pretty rotten too. Basically, there are rules in the financial services chapter. It's another of the 29 chapters. By the way, 29 chapters in TPP, only five have to do with trade, would prohibit bans on risky derivatives. A ban is zero market access. Um, it would not allow capital controls or like the Robin Hood speculative taxes. Says who? Elizabeth Warren and Barney Frank. There's two different chapters in TPP that would jack up medicine prices. One has patent extensions. Um, that would make it hard to get generics. It would also have what's called data exclusivity, extended. So that means even when a, when a patent <coughs> monopoly period for medicine of 20 years to plea is gone, you can't get the data to go to your health agency to prove the generic is safe. So it's like having an extra 10 years or 15 years of a patent, even though the patent's run, because you can't get the information, you can't get the approval, you can't have a generic. Plus, there is this unbelievably rotten, and I, it's a boomerang thing. I don't know if the U.S. negotiators don't believe it or under, understand what they're doing, but we were trying to <coughs> attack the national health care drug pricing cost containment policies of New Zealand and Australia on behalf of Big Pharma. 
That's depressing enough, but that's what the U.S. negotiators are doing. But the way they've actually written the text, it could boomerang back on, well, the new rights under Obamacare to have more medicine pricing formularies in Medicare and Medicaid. These are the boards where you have pharmacologists and doctors who get together and say, hey, we don't need another high blood pressure medicine because these three that are generic work really great. And this new one, this brand name that costs 10 times as much, it's not any better, it doesn't have lower side effects, let's not approve that, let's just keep the, so they keep the prices down, but they, now if something good and new comes in, then they say, okay, we've got to have that new one, it's under patent, then they go and negotiate a bulk purchasing price. Well, the pharmaceutical companies hate that, because that means they can't keep evergreening drugs, and also, someone goes and negotiates with them about how much they're going to reimburse for the thing that is under monopoly patent. So this language that's in there would let Big Pharma actually have a seat at the table with the pharmacologists and the doctors to challenge your decisions. Great. Limits on import safety. There's a rule that we'd have to import meat and poultry that doesn't meet US rules and technical terms. That's called regulatory equivalence. I call it the TPP diet. Um, <laughs> it's a particular issue for you guys, for instance, with your shrimp. Um, farther down south, also fish that are farmed. And um, some of the TPP countries are countries that have serious problems with import safety with their seafood, shrimp, and fish. Food labels could get challenged to trade barriers so we don't even know where it's from. And then the final thing is, I don't remember, anyone remember SOPA, Stop Online Piracy Act, yes. uh -huh. the internet freedom issue? All right, if all of what I said wasn't enough to turn your stomachs, the copyright chapter of TPP has a chunk of SOPA in it. And we only know that because of that piece of that lead too. Um, basically, it's not the whole thing, but it's a good half of it. So the stuff about the mandatory fines for non-commercial, small-scale <coughs> copying. So you know, if you not, if you if you are actually ripping stuff off and copying and selling it, you deserve a penalty. But like, if I have a recipe, I serve something to my mom. My mom says that was great. Where'd you get that? I actually bought it off of for two dollars off of Gourmet's website, whatever. They don't think about it. I send my mom that recipe. That technically is a copyright violation. I'm sending something that's copyrighted that I paid for to somebody else that I'm not charging and I'm doing it to one person. So that's an example of small scale non-commercial. We all do that every day without thinking about it actually. That is the kind of stuff that could get sanctioned under SOPA and under this piece of mandatory fines for not small scale men. And the liability would also be on the carrier to make sure people who did that were cut off. So you could both be fined and thrown off the internet. Or pages would just go black, basically. They blank out pages if they thought that there was not, the pages weren't following. So the, the, this part of TPP is one that's got the ACLU and different folks who've never been in a trade agreement wound up. And then what about the actual trade part? Now, when TPP got started, we already had free trade agreements with the nations that were 80% combined GDP in the block. Then three big economies joined in, but we already have free trade agreement with NAFTA and Mexico. So if zeroing out tariffs, is how it can actually succeed, which by the way, we know how NAFTA turned out, it isn't. And I, I didn't put in all the slides about the trade deficit. But the thing we know after 20 years is that actually our export growth does better to the countries we don't have free trade agreements with. US export growth is 37% <coughs> higher to the countries we don't have free trade agreements with. Because when we have the free trade agreements, we have the investor offshoring rules. So we don't export goods. Our companies go there and then send us the stuff back. So when we don't have those investor offshoring incentives, those actually countries we don't have deals with are the ones we send more stuff to. Wow. It's counterintuitive. It's a free trade agreement that actually has the opposite outcome. So look at the countries that are in there. Vietnam, per capita income, $1,100 a year. New Zealand's 4.3 million people. Love them, but not a big market. Uh, Brunei's 400,000 people. Okay, that's really small. Together, they're less than the GDP of Iowa. And then you have Malaysia, middle-income country, not very populous, but that's something. So Japan becomes the big thing. That's the big economic thing you're going to hear about. But there's just this complication. Japan has a really long history of currency manipulation. So you cut a deal where you cut tariffs 10%, but then they devalue their currency 10%. So it just neutralizes basically the effect of what you just negotiated. And um, in very early in, in 2012, industry industry, the automobile industry, etc., wrote a letter to the president saying, you want Japan this agreement? We've always said there need to be currency discipline, so rules that if you cheat on currency, you get some countervailing snapback tariff. We always said, the industry said, if you're going to have China and other countries in this agreement, you need to have currency discipline, so we can't, just can't cheat it. But if you're having Japan in right now, you have to have these currency disciplines. Absolutely. And this, again, was not laborers, was not the consumer groups. This was the industry saying it. 
and the trade representative, the United States trade representative, refused and has refused and has not brought it up to the table. So just last week, 60 senators, both of yours, but a really bipartisan bunch, 17 Republicans in there, sent a letter, 60 senators, i.e. enough to stop or do anything, sent a, a letter to the president saying, <clears throat> we really were serious about that. <laughs> and 230 of the 435 House members, so you know, 218 is half the House. You win or lose on 218. So 230 and 60, them's the numbers. And they've all said, you know, hello, we really weren't joking about that. Um, it's still not on the table. And the trade representative's response has been, we don't think that should be in the agreement. Now you might ask why, because they put everything else, including the kitchen sink in there, that really doesn't have to do with trade, and this does have to do with trade. Thing. All right. Another little complication is that Japan's ruling party has listed a whole bunch of things they want excluded or they won't stay in TPP. So it's either they're in TPP and yet theoretically they're the big market, but you can't actually trade with them in certain things that the U.S. would want to. And then a lot of the companies say that there are, even when you get a tariff cut, even if you have currency disciplines, they're not tariff barriers. But the special thing for North Carolina is probably the rules and origin for textiles and apparel. And you know, after NAFTA, after CAFTA, those trade partners, now we've got these integrated industries. And it's called the, the system of what's called the rule of origin, what has to be from what country to get the tariff cut. For TPP, so far, has been what's called yarn forward for textiles. And that would basically require that the inputs are within the block of TPP countries. Vietnam, whose big export industry is textile and apparel, mainly apparel, they want to get textiles from China and then get duty-free access for that apparel. Not get textiles from here or get textiles from you know, one of the other Mexico in the TPP block. And there's a huge fight on this. So far, the US has stood on the yarn forward rule. Um, Vietnam, as a result, is not really negotiating the other parts of the agreement until they get them to cave on that. That would be sort of literally the end. If there was a, a, a TPP with Vietnam, and Malaysia is not insignificant, that didn't have that yarn forward rule, that would be sort of the end of what already has been a shell shock industry in the US, just FYI. And a large part of it's here, so I wanted to flag that. So how do we lose control and get into this mess? How can say 60 senators just be ignored? Last point, and then we'll go to Q&A, fast track. Fast track is this arcane procedure, it's only been used 16 times, Nixon cooked it up, that delegates away Congress's constitutional authority over trade. So our Congress actually has exclusive authority over the substance of trade. And I jokingly call this the Boston Tea Party hangover clause. Because our country started a trade war, right? So King George said, oh, I need some money to go like fight with Spain and France. What am I going to do? Oh, tariffs on the colonies. Unilateral. So, you know, the Federalist Papers talk about why trade has to be in the body closest to the people. So you don't get any more King George unilateral, I'm doing it for whatever reason, kind of tariffs. And so Congress, historically for 200 years, really had like the steering wheel, the emergency brake, the gas pedal, everything on trade. And they sent off the executive branch negotiators to make deals for them, and they told them exactly what the hell to do. Because it is a check and balance. The executive branch represents the US government to foreign sovereigns. They're the negotiators, that's like the deal. But Congress had the contacts. So Nixon comes in, you know, it's a shocking thing. He thought maybe he could grab some power. Okay. Nixon comes in and he decides, you know, we've had this trade fight over here with the, w, with the GAC before. I want to use that to come up with this new procedure. And he upends 200 years of how we did trade policy and he gets this thing called Fast Track. Fast Track gives away five major congressional rights. The executive branch unilaterally picks the country they want to negotiate with, does the entire deal, and signs it before Congress votes, entering into it, then gets to write legislation, yes, this is the one bill they actually write over at the White House, implementing all the changes to domestic law needed to implement the agreement, plus adopting the agreement as US federal law. This is not subject to committee markups. It then goes into the hopper directly, guaranteed yes or no vote, 60 days in the House, 30 more days in the Senate, no amendments in the floor, limited debate, including in the Senate. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a legislative luge run. From the day the executive branch decides what they want in this agreement to the day that Congress sees it zoom by and can't have any of the normal review, amendments, oversight, this loss of control is incredibly dangerous. So even if you love TPP, if you saw all that stuff and you say, I love that, I want to make sure that happens, 
you still don't want fast track. Because fast track means there's no oversight. There's no openness. The agreement's signed before it even gets made public. You don't even know what's in it. This is a process that has only been needed for agreements that could not get through Congress if they got seen publicly in air. So since 1974, it's only been used 16 times. Um, Clinton didn't have it for most of his time, Mr. Trade Expansion. 130 trade agreements, two of them needed fast track, NAFTA and WTO. All the other ones, normal process. And the last delegation of this authority ended in 07. A lot of presidents haven't been able to get it. Clinton didn't get his, he got voted down on the House floor in 98. 171 Democrats, 71 Republicans. Even if originally when these trade agreements were mainly about tariffs, fast track was appropriate, it sure as heck isn't now when we are rewriting wide swaths of U.S. non-trade policy through diplomatic legislating. If anything, Congress needs a wider role, not a lesser role in this moment. So what's the situation? When President Obama was a candidate, he said replace it, was not democratic, was not inclusive. Heartbreakingly, now that he has TPP starting to smell, Every month it sits out, it's like a dead fish in the sun, and more people are noticing the problems. He's starting to think actually he may need fast track to get it to Congress, so he's now asked for it. And there is an old version of fast track, the last one that was in effect from 2002 that some of the trade committee guys are dusting off. Um, I guess the question is, will the Democrats, who almost all these congressional Democrats in the House don't like TPP, they've gotten savvy to it. And the Republicans don't really love Obama. Will they get together and say, no, we're going to actually stick up with actual normal order? This is kind of a transpartisan issue because it's actually about checks and balances, it's about Congress's role. It's not an issue that is about Democrats versus Republicans. It's about what's the role of Congress, what kind of existential political trouble the Democrats and Republicans get into if they basically give away their authority to do anything on an issue where the polls show actually a majority of Democrats and Republicans and independents don't want any more of the same old NAFTA agreements. It's one of those few issues where you poll across the political spectrum. So last point, our trade mess, not an act of God or an accident. This was put in place as a specific policy, their choices. I'm a recovering trade attorney. I could write you a totally different kind of trade agreement. Bad process, one set of rules, that's the outcome we've had and it can be changed. So please, learn more. Pros and cons, we have links on both sides. Expose the TPP.org, you got these cards. These basically is just fact sheets, they're also action ideas, they're links to folks in different countries. Tradewatch.org is our somewhat wonkier website. It is long, it is wonky. There are also quick things on it, but if you really want to get down the weeds about, like is that lady crazy about how TPP could undermine Medicare and Medicaid pricing, there is the 60 page. 400 foot legal memo that goes through each of those programs and explains which provisions would conflict with which part of the leaked text. And there's that depth of analysis on all the issues if you want to get into the weeds on whatever one of these issues that may actually hit your passions. Because there's so many different pieces of it for the more detailed stuff. Sort of look, look to us. Local organizations getting involved are sponsors today, but also witness for peace. Here are business size, the NIFTO, the National Council of Textile Organizations. Um, the, the, um, the work basically is both educational and outreach. So you know what, what NC Policy Watch, what the State Fed, the State AFL-CIO are doing, what we're doing is meeting with members, educating their members, meeting with members of Congress. And then there are a lot of unusual national organizations involved. So for instance, the American Medical Association is pretty much on the war path about those patent extensions and the, the language of pharmaceutical transparency. But you also have things like the US Business and Industry Council, a very conservative small business group. Or the American Jobs Alliance, another very conservative group. I put some conservative ones in there. The Electronic Frontiers Forum is, is basically a group that does internet freedom issues. And then you know contact, contact your members of Congress. Either way, but whether there is this fast track giveaway of power and what TPP looks like in the end is something that they control, so it's something you control. Also, anyone who wants to know the nitty gritty on fast track, I brought a couple copies of my new book on the entire history of trade authorities since the founding. And believe it or not, it's actually a story. We've got a grant 
who went to the Library of Congress's stacks and looked at all the stuff from the pre-electronic records, so from the 1700s. And um, you can just skip to like halfway through and start with fast track. But actually, the early stuff is kind of interesting because it's a perennial turf battle. And um, but for some of the these and thous and like the 1780s records, a lot of the debate would be recognized today. Um, the the punchline of this basically lays out what is the new kind of process we should have for trade agreements because we're not against having some mechanism. We have to have some coordination. But this lays out a different way to do it. So I, I brought a couple of these. Unfortunately, I have to sell them, but I can sell them for cost. And now, I thank you all for your attention. I know I've just totally flooded you with info, but Q&A. Yeah. Let's go, Brian.